Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, longtime unschooling mom and author. Join me and my wonderful guests for interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free introductory ebook, What is Unschooling?, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hi everyone, I'm Pam Larickia and this is episode number 55 of the podcast. It's the 18th of January, 2017, as I record this intro. In this episode, I chat with James and Taylor Davis. We had a great conversation digging into their unschooling lives. Uh, We talk about the experiences that led them from teaching to unschooling, how they bring the principles of unschooling into summer camp. Taylor shares what works for her to move through those rough patches when she begins to doubt unschooling. Uh, James digs even deeper into a wonderful quote of his that I share from a recent online article. And we talk about how they make their unschooling lifestyle work. I'm really happy that I got to chat with both of them, and it was a really fun conversation. As an update this week, I thought I'd share where I'm speaking next month. I'm participating in the Canadian Online Homeschool Conference, which runs from February 3rd to the 7th. It's free to register, and each day's sessions are available to watch for free for 48 hours. My session runs on the first day when the theme is homeschool methods. Uh, My talk is called uh, The Art of Unschooling, and you can join me to explore what unschooling parents do after they drop the curriculum, including 10 helpful tips for your journey to unschooling. So that means once you register, my talk will be free to watch February 3rd and 4th. And I also plan to hang out in the day one chat, which is February 3rd at 4 p.m. Eastern time. So it would be lots of fun to see you there. You'll find a link in the show notes. And just so you know, that's an affiliate link. If you do choose to purchase the all access package to watch the sessions after the conference is over, I'll get a small commission. But as I said, they're all free for 48 hours. So hopefully you can fit any sessions you'd like to see into your schedule. And you likely won't be interested in them all. It is a general homeschooling conference, but there are definitely some you might find interesting. I am also speaking alongside Sue Patterson and Erica Davis-Petrie at the Unschoolers Platform Conference in the Chicago area, February 13th to 17th. This is an immersive unschooling family conference, and bonus, it's at a water park. Yay, water in February. (laughs) Sounds awesome. It looks like it'll be lots of fun for the whole family. And beyond the water park and all the talks, there's also a family game night, a movie night, and a Valentine's Day dance party. You can check out all the information on their website, unschoolersplatform.com. And I'll also put the link in the show notes. I'm really looking forward to hanging out with a bunch of unschooling families. And if you do go, please come up and say hi. I'd also like to say a big thank you to everyone supporting the show on Patreon, especially new patron Michelle Cherry. And we hit the $100 a month pledge mark. (laughs) Thank you so, so much. I am humbled by everyone's support, and it definitely inspires me to do my best to put together a great episode for you guys every week. It also means that Rocco and I have been immersed in microphone research. It's great that we have a year's worth of experience under our belt now. It's definitely helping us narrow down the choice. And if you'd like to support the show, even for as little as a dollar a month, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash exploring unschooling. And this week, I want to share a quote from the episode. Taylor shared this insight. Every minute that I spend living in that place of fear about whatever hypothetical thing I'm worried about might happen in the future, it's just eating away at my time right now with my kids and with my family. It's something she tries to remember when she finds herself in that rough patch and begins to doubt on schooling. It helps her remember to take the time to really and truly connect with her kids. Fear is disconnecting. 
and reconnecting helps her remember that most of the things we fear might happen just don't really matter much in the grand scheme of things. And that's been my experience as well. Maybe try it next time you're starting to feel fearful. Ask yourself if what's really happening is that you've become distanced from your kids. And if so, be purposeful in reconnecting and see where that takes you. And now, let's dive into that interview. Hi everyone, I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca and today I'm here with Taylor and James Davis. Hi to you both. Hi Pam. Hi Pam. Hi, it's so nice to have you here. Uh, just as a little bit of background, Taylor and James originally went to college to be teachers. Uh, this preponderance of homeschooling and unschooling parents who originally pursued a teaching career isn't surprising. To me, it seems to be indicative of their personal interest in children and in learning, because I know last week we also had uh, a former teacher as well. So I'm really excited to chat with Taylor and James about the next steps in their journey and where they've gone from there. So first, can you guys tell us a bit about you and your family? Sure. So, uh, yeah, we've been married, I guess, since 2008. We had our first child, Oliver, in 2010. And, you know, you mentioned that we both went to school to be teachers. That's true. Uh, I actually didn't wind up becoming a teacher. Taylor taught in an elementary school for a number of years. But um, for quite a while, I was actually playing poker professionally. And we were traveling around and trying to figure out where we wanted to settle down, that sort of thing. And eventually, we settled down in New Jersey and bought a house and started down a pretty traditional path until we had our first son. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, <laughs> he was our greatest teacher in so many ways. But uh, primarily, he taught us uh, the importance of his own autonomy. And, and it really started getting us questioning everything. You know, I think both Taylor myself, but maybe more me. I had a, a difficult time growing up and trying to fit into the molds that uh, society had and the presented options, you know. And uh, when we started to see that in him, really from the time he was just a month or so old, um, you know, it started really bringing up all of the, you know, hard parts about being a kid and which parts of those we felt were kind of a necessary thing and which parts of those we could uh, try to transcend and do better than. So uh, that was really what started us, I think, on our unschooling exploration. Um, um, and then, you know, we moved all over the place. We went and uh, ran a nonprofit camp that had already existed called Vanderkamp for four years in upstate New York before uh, finally settling out here in the seacoast of New Hampshire. That's very cool. I really love the uh, poker player history. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's uh, part of my unorthodox past, I guess. Yeah, it's so interesting to, you know, hear where people are coming from and, and their different perspectives they bring because it's just fascinating to see the, the wide array of places from which we can all, you know, kind of get to this point, especially when we start to have kids because it's that's when you start considering those questions, right? I always say my eldest also set me off on this journey as well. Yeah, well, Absolutely. it's funny, you know, for us, we... Uh, you know, playing poker out of college, basically the way I didn't plan to do it. I just wanted to kind of do something to fill my time until Taylor finished school. And, you know, I was going to teach too. And, and we were just going to settle down somewhere. And, you know, I had always been someone while I had a rebellious side, I always did the right thing. You know, I got good grades in high school, got good grades in college, did, you know, things that people approve of by and large. Our summer jobs were working at camp and working with kids. And um, this first time I kind of stepped off course and started doing this poker thing, I saw a lot of uh, a lack of trust from a lot of people in my life that this was a wise decision. And a lot of people had other plans for how they thought I should be spending my time. And it was the first time, you know, I was doing very well in my early twenties. And I started thinking, you know, why am I living to please other people for my whole <laughs> life? You know, and, and this is so obviously a good force in our life. Why don't people see that? And why don't they trust it? And I think that really laid a lot of the foundation for not wanting our kids to have to struggle with those same feelings, you know? Yeah. Was that your experience too, Taylor? I think so. My experience um, growing up, I was very much so, um, you know, I have fond memories of my childhood and my parents were gentle, um, but I definitely kind of just can feel a feeling of always wanting people to approve and wanting to make people proud. Um, and I think I still struggle with that a lot. And so I think for me, a lot of my still current de-schooling comes from kind of that um, that feeling a need to kind of look like I'm doing the appropriate thing and to please people and to stay on course. And James and I have totally not stayed on course at all um, in terms of, you know, what mainstream culture tells us to do. And so that's definitely been my experience and um, 
really, really trying to break away from that so that, um, you know, our kids don't have to feel that. Yeah. I mean, that was a huge part of, uh, me, uh, deciding and choosing to, to leave my job, um, way back when, because, you know, that was kind of the culmination of everything that I'd been doing, you know, right. quote, right. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. remember listening to you talk about that on previous episodes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I guess uh, I just uh-huh, real quick, we'll add, um, mm-hmm. just in, to get a better understanding of our family. So James mentioned Oliver, he's our oldest, he's six. Um, and then just, um, we have Ezra who's four And then we have August, who is 10 months old. So that kind of rounds out our family. And we have a dog who we've had since about right after we got married. (laughs) It feels like forever. Yeah. 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 That feels like forever. (laughs) Oh, that's awesome. So yeah, you guys are a busy, uh, busy family, right? We are. Absolutely. (laughs) In the good way. (laughs) Yeah. A lot less busy than than we could be. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. as I mentioned earlier, and you guys talked about, you both went to college to be teachers. And now you, as you've talked about a little bit, you're embracing the unschooling lifestyle completely. I was wondering if you could share with us a little bit about that experience going to uh, college and what happened to change your course. Sure. Um, so, yeah, we both kind of fell into kind of following the path to become teachers in college. I think, like you said, largely because, you know, we both had worked at summer camp for many years and really loved working with kids. Um, And we kind of felt like, well, this is the next step to continuing working with kids. You know, we liked it. We felt like we were decent at it. Um, And so we both graduated with teaching licenses. And as we, you know, recently we've reflected on what we learned in our teacher education programs. And it actually is kind of astonishing to us that, nowhere along the line for either of us. And we were at different colleges. Um, did anything about, um, really home education or self-directed education come up at all? Um, and, you know, looking back on it, it just feels like such a huge, huge piece of the puzzle was missing. Um, but anyway, you know, we, we took a little time after college and then I did settle into a teaching job in New Jersey. I think I taught for four years, um, at a private school. Um, So I had a little more freedom in what I did in the classroom just because we weren't bound to some of the state regulations. Um, But it was actually an in-service training that I went to at work um, where they showed us the person who came in to train us um, on various things. But anyway, he showed us one of Sir Ken Robinson's um, videos and I I, I can't remember which one it was. But anyway, I came home and I was just educational paradigms, I think. Yeah, changing. Yep. And I came home and this was after our son had been born. So, you know, we had, I had gone back to work. Our son was in daycare, um, which also was not going well because he just wanted to be with me. Um, (laughs) But I came home and I showed James this video and we listened to this talk. And that was kind of like our, you know, that sent us down the rabbit hole. And that's where, you know, before that we were really, we were ready to send Ollie to public school probably. Um, Mm -hmm. so that sent us down the rabbit hole and we just started finding out more and more about unschooling and reading about different options for self-directed education. Um, and at that point we kind of, that's when everything in our life changed. You know, we said we need to find a way for me to be home with Oliver. And that's when we moved and started running that camp in New York. So, um, yeah, that's kind of where it all began for us. Yeah. And I think too, like when we were, when you're training to become a teacher or when you're working at summer camp, uh, working with kids is a little bit more abstract almost like the kids are there and they're there before you, but it's a lot easier to talk yourself into kind of these, I don't know, utilitarian or or pragmatic approaches where, yeah, sure, this isn't going to work for everybody, but it's going to work for most people. And, you know, if some kids just won't conform, then that's their problem and their families. And, you know, people don't say those things (laughs) directly, but that's kind of the culture, right? Um, And for me, though, it was like, but what if that's my kid? You know, (laughs) what if it's my personal kid that's not, you know, in the 95 or 90 or 80 or less percent that is able to conform here? And it just started feeling, I don't know, the weight of it all, I think, just started to feel so, especially after we watched that Sir Ken Robinson video. And and I remember, T, we talked and I was like, so what are you going to do about this when you get into school? You know, are you going to change everything and, you know, start sparking all this creativity? And your response was like, well, there's not really much I can do every day. The curriculum is planned. <laughs> so it yeah, was, it was like, kind of ironic just, that they showed yeah. us this when there wasn't much we could do. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, I remember too. That was the same thing when, because uh, I was trying to work with the, with uh, my kids' teachers, especially my eldest, right? And uh, I went in and I talked to them. I gave, the, the principal invited me into one of their teachers' meetings to give a presentation on spirited kids, right? Because mm-hmm. this was uh, uh, something that I was talking to him about, uh, as you were talking about, James. It's so interesting that, because I think that's such a great point that, you know, as a system, they're looking at at children as a group, not as right. individuals, right? So here I was asking them to look at the individual, you know, and and they were open to it and they thanked they all thanked me for the presentation. They thought it was wonderful. Mm. But that was the exact same thing, Taylor. They said, but you know, there's nothing I can really do yeah. in the classroom, right? Yeah, well yeah, I think they got the trapped thing. in this sorry, go ahead, T. No, uh, go ahead. <laughs> All I was going to say is I think, and this is why it becomes so challenging because when you're in those environments, you know, they, they start with this one basic premise or assumption, which is that the academic takeaways are so important and so urgent that um, anything else is kind of, you know, window dressing on the side of it, right? So when we worked at camp, it was all about building up the individual and how can we help these people to survive better and, you know, potentially be on a track towards lifelong happiness. You know, those were our goals. And in a school, you know, the incentives are just different, right? Like they have to get kids to read by a certain age and get kids to understand certain math concepts before they go to high school. And so in that sort of like rat race environment, it makes sense that if some kids can't figure this out in time, well, hey, the, the rest of these kids are going to be screwed if, if they can't figure it out too. And so I understand why they feel this urgency around the academic stuff. But for me, that's just totally beside the point. You know, like when you see someone just struggling as a human being, who cares if they know fractions, right? But um, that's just not a conversation that they're ever ready to have. Yeah, it's true. Because I mean, the way the system is designed is 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 it's well designed to accomplish what it's trying to accomplish right mm-hmm. because it's not it's not focused on the individual its point is all the children need to get through this system right that's mm-hmm. that's its job so you know to most efficiently do that that's that's what their goal is it's it's not the the individual and helping them cope with it <laughs> right yeah, that's fascinating. <laughs> um, you guys have mentioned camp a couple of times, and I was hoping you could tell us a bit about uh, where you are now with Camp Stomping Ground, right? Yeah, and yeah. What- what role it's played in your unschooling journeys? Well, it's been amazing. I mean, so we started, so we started at Vander Camp, which I mentioned, and, you know, that was a church, a church owned camp that had been around for about 50 years and uh, they were struggling financially. And so, you know, we came in, uh, we had, we were just fresh off of learning about these ideas. We had watched the Ken Robinson video. We actually watched a documentary called Surfwise. I don't know if you've ever seen that one, but um, it's kind of a accidental unschooling video about this uh, doctor yeah. who just surfed with his kids for, you know, whatever, for 20 years in the seventies. And they traveled anyway, around. we were, yeah, cool. exactly. it's a, it's a really good one. It's not, I don't know. It's not one you would want to put if you were trying to like mainstream the ideas of unschooling necessarily, because their family was a little kooky, but Hey, we all are. In some ways, <laughs> right? But, um, but anyway, we had just come off watching these. And so our pitch to all these different camps that I applied at was, well, what if we come and just let kids do whatever they want? You know, uh, if we keep everyone safe and, you know, no one's getting injured and no one's getting like abused or or bullied, what if we just let them do whatever and see how it goes? And um, most camps said, no, that sounds like a really bad idea. And <laughs> there was this one camp that uh, was open to it and, and primarily because they were really struggling financially. And I think they saw our energy and, you know, they saw that this was a new thing and they had about a six month runway uh, before they were going to have to shut down this 50 year old institution. And so they said, sure, why don't you come try your crazy thing? And if it doesn't work, then well, at least we'll have tried everything. Uh, so we went there and it was interesting because Ollie at that time was still only about one year old. So, you know, we didn't really know anything about letting kids yeah. be free. I mean, we all we had ever done was work in schools or at this other much more traditional summer camp where kids had a schedule planned out for them, didn't really have any choice over how they spent their time. And so for us, we were very enthusiastic about the ideas of unschooling without ever having seen them in practice. <laughs> so <laughs> we, uh, but like logically and emotionally, they resonated with us. And, and it's certainly our goals of helping kids feel happier in the long term and in the present. Right. Uh, and so we went there and it was really interesting. This, um, you know, kind of side by side look on watching Oliver grow up and also watching what happened with the kids at camp, because at camp, kids from all different backgrounds, you know, very diverse areas, uh, very hard areas in Syracuse to very rural areas in upstate New York. And 
what we found was when they came together, they didn't want to walk all over us. They didn't want to pick on each other. They really have, took this freedom very seriously and, and they valued it as something precious and would oftentimes give very like intentional voice to that and say, wow, I can't believe people here let me choose what I want to eat or what kind of footwear I should wear or what I want to wear when I go swimming. You know, <laughs> these very little little things, it wow. sounds like, you know, but they valued it so deeply. And, and so for us, it really strengthened our resolve to do this unschooling based thing. And so, of course, eventually, you know, the the further you go down these holes and uh, the more you learn about unschooling and letting kids be free, uh, you want to test the boundaries even more. And eventually, I think some of the things we wanted to push the boundaries on weren't uh, of a of a proper comfort level for the people who actually own the camp. And so even though the camp did very well financially, I mean, we doubled uh, doubled enrollment in two years and almost tripled it by the time we left, uh, just based on, frankly, word of mouth and people really resonating with the experience. Uh, you know, not all, the board wasn't fully bought in on a, on a mm -hmm. kind of emotional level. And mm -hmm. so we decided we wanted to try something new. So we got together with um, the two camp directors now for Stomping Ground. Their names are Jack and Laram, two phenomenal uh, younger folks that came and worked for me at Vandercamp. And uh, we're very also agreed that we wanted to start a new thing that would push the boundaries even further. Um, they had a lot of time <laughs> and were very willing to spearhead this new project with us. And so with a couple of other co-founders, we launched Stomping Ground in 2014. Um, we, our first summer, we had about 60 kids come out in a facility in New Jersey. And then last summer we had almost 200 in our second summer and that our new facilities in deposit New York. And, uh, basically the idea is kids come and they're self-directed. They choose how they spend their entire day. Uh, we have pre-programmed activities that we offer, but nothing is mandatory at all. Everything is fully optional. And, you know, a lot of times that looks like teenagers hanging out and, being friends with each other and learning to love one another and younger kids getting covered in shaving cream and doing all sorts of silly stuff. And uh, it's been very well received and, and we're really, really excited to see where that new community, you know, totally grounded in the ideas of unschooling can go from here. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a mouthful. It's, I can talk and talk. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I could listen and listen. That's really that's really fascinating. And and I love that. So I I mean most of uh, the kids that come to camp they're they're not unschooling kids, are they? They're school kids, but they can really, you know, um, transition reasonably well into this environment. And as you said, they they really feel quite respectful of it. Yeah, well, it's interesting. So at Vandercamp, it was all schooled kids for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, and then at Stomping Ground, we found we have a, a pretty good mix. I can't give you exact numbers now, but I'd say the first summer we ran, it was probably about an a third of them were unschooled kids. Um, and people would travel, you know, we had people flying from Arizona and Georgia. I mean, you know, unschoolers yep. travel. <laughs> when, yep, yep. They, just get, <laughs> they just get so excited to meet people who uh, agree with them on things. It's so unusual <laughs> that when you find something, you cherish it, right? Um, but, you know, now we're a little bit more geographically centered around the New York, Pennsylvania and New Jersey area. We actually get a ton of kids from the Philly Free School, um, mm -hmm. which is, you know, a free school in Philadelphia. And we're very tapped into the free school network in sort of the tri-state area. So um, it's this really interesting mix of kids who are schooled uh, classically, uh, unschooled completely, and people in like these more free school environments. And the really neat thing is getting them all together because then it's this open environment of sharing. Like you can see the gear is turning on the, the school, the people who go to traditional public school and they're like, now hold on a second. <laughs> you don't have <laughs> any class. <laughs> yeah. And so it's this really beautiful discussions and, and exploration that can happen. And also, you know, unschooled kids, I think oftentimes gain a, a stronger appreciation of what they have too, because they can, they meet these really wonderful friends who are, you know, don't have a lot of the same luxuries in terms of their time. Uh, we've seen families challenge their own uh, schooling approaches and their own approaches to working with kids and everything in between. It's been it's been actually really, really neat to see what happens when all these different, you know, or kids from all these different schooling environments and backgrounds, uh, when they get together, what happens. Have you seen that as well, Taylor? Like how how um, that kind of community, that camping community informed your unschooling journey? Yeah, I think so. I think it's really just... Um... Well, I think I would say my unschooling journey has been um, kind of informed by a lot of different things, but the camp community at Stomping Ground has been a big part of it because it's it's really incredible to see um, kids show up at camp and be given such an in such a high amount of trust by the people who are running the camp that many of them are not afforded in their daily life, and to see that 
really for the most part, they, they are totally trustworthy. Um, and I think that, you know, um, we have this tendency to, we don't trust kids, um, in so Mm -hmm. many ways, which is, you know, where so much of the attempt to control their lives comes from. And I don't think it comes from a bad place. Oftentimes it just comes from a place of truly thinking that, you know, we know better. Um, and so seeing, seeing, you know, older children too, who haven't been trusted a lot, come to camp and be given this trust. And again, like I said, for the most part, you know, become and be these trustworthy people is really inspiring. Like it doesn't take long. They just are trustworthy. And um, seeing that in action is kind of really reassuring for our own unschooling journey, I think. Yeah, because I mean, your kids are are on the younger side, right? right? So you're really just more officially getting into it now. Absolutely. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. As far as the government's concerned, for sure. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. When you when you have to register. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. We just had to register our oldest this year. You know, yeah. you mentioned to you, like when kids come to camp and, you know, their process of learning to embrace freedom wisely. Uh, one of the areas in particular that I find interesting is um, around time management. So, you know, we get like I know this one family who's very close to us. Um, you know, they unschool their kids and they come out from New Hampshire to New York to bring their kids to camp. And um, their daughter stays up in, in their her home life really late, you know, wakes up really late. And that's kind of her cycle and no big deal. But at camp, the incentives are such she wants to wake up and hang out with her friends. And so she just has no problem at all setting the schedule for her. And it's not like it's a job. Nothing is going to be really lost if she decides to sleep in. But now nah, she just goes to bed when people go to bed and wakes up at seven, just like everyone else does and hangs out, you know, and it's <laughs> like the de-schooling process or whatever whatever you want to call it. I, I think uh, adjusting to having freedom, you know, I think sometimes de-schooling can even get a, I don't know, that that sometimes leaves a sour taste in my mouth, that term. Um, but the idea of, of embracing freedom and understanding like that these people, these young adults in many cases, they want the same things for their lives that we want from them, right? To connect with others and to accomplish mm-hmm. things. And, and they have no problem doing that. You know, like the incentives are powerful enough. They're more powerful than uh, wake up and do your chores. It's like, wow, I can form connections with people. I'll get up at seven. Who cares? You know? Um, yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, when it's the whole thing, when you see them, when there's things they want to do, goals they have for themselves or things they want to accomplish, you know, and, and it's not even that we, they use formal language like that, but you mm-hmm. know, this is today, this is what my options are. This is what I want to do. And, and they'll go off and do it no matter what it means. Right. They'll, yeah. they'll make, they can, they can make these adjustments, you know, that all, Oh, if they don't have to get up for school, they'll never be able to get up for a job. Silly right. stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> True. <laughs> Um, next question. I was wondering what you guys do then when you hit a rough patch and might begin to doubt unschooling once in a while. Okay. So we decided I would take the lead on this one because (laughs) my, my, my doubt creeps in much more often than James is. And I think that's just more a function of my personality. I tend to be more of a worrier and a bit more anxious than him. Um, Mm -hmm. so I have a list of a lot of things that I do when I begin to doubt. Um, (laughs) but I would say that I think, um, at least for me, my doubt started creeping in probably a bit more, um, as our oldest kind of reached school age. Um, and I think I thought that wouldn't happen. I had heard how that happened to people. And I think I thought, no, I would be immune from it. It's totally fine. Um, but kind of as I reflect on, you know, just our experiences, it definitely has happened a bit. So, um, I think, For me, the academic part of unschooling, um, just in terms of, you know, not not choosing curriculum for your kids and requiring them to do things to learn, you know, the basics like reading and writing and math, that part comes pretty easily to me. I'm not really worried about that. Um, I see my kids, you know, I see my kids learning math just through all of the ways they choose to spend their time. Our oldest is like really, really starting to learn to figure out words now completely naturally. And he's finding a lot of joy. Um, so that part isn't hard. I think for me, um, the bigger parts are, um, just finding myself like still wanting to control how my kids spend their time and thinking that they need this large variety of experiences when they may be super focused on one thing for a long period of time. Um, Mm -hmm. So usually the first thing I do is talk to James when I'm feeling doubtful. <laughs> That's great. That's true. <laughs> uh, and he's really patient and really helpful. And I'm so grateful that um, that he is so invested and believes so deeply in this because he helps to kind of bring me back to center on it and remind me when I'm feeling doubtful of anything, kind of remind me of the you know, the logical reasons why we're choosing this path. So that's always really helpful. Um, 
and I probably drive him a little crazy, but, um, (laughs) so that's one of the first things I usually do. Um, another thing that I do often is just to kind of recenter myself is I'll go back to, um, reading about people's experiences with unschooling, you know, people who are a bit further into it than me. Um, like your blog is a place that I go sometimes when I feel like I'm doubting, um, or I'll just, you know, go into some Facebook groups and check in on some of the threads where people are talking. Cause that sometimes just, um, encourages me. Um, Mm -hmm. and then I would say we are really, really lucky. Um, and we kind of sought it out a little bit, but I don't think we knew we'd get as lucky as we did that where we live, um, we have a huge handful of friends who are all unschooling there with their children. Um, and so I think the local support for me is huge. Um, just spending time with our friends who are also doing the same thing with their kids. And some of them have older kids. Some of them have kids the same age as our kids and some even have younger kids. Um, but spending time with them and just seeing kind of the relative peace in their families and seeing the way that all of our kids kind of interact with one another, um, and being able to be together with people who get it and who are also giving their kids space to be exactly who they are is really, really helpful. And, um, cause I can find it sometimes stressful to be, not all the time, but sometimes stressful to be around families who have a different relationship with their kids. Um, so that's really helpful. And then, you know, myself and three other moms who are all unschooling moms, we try to meet like every month or so for coffee um, and kind of talk about the challenges and the things that are going well. And I find that really helpful, too. So I really I know that there aren't unschoolers everywhere, but I also feel like if 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 you dig, you might find some. And so I just really encourage other people to to see um, if they can find anybody in their local community, because that's been really helpful to me. Yeah, I know there's um, a recommendation I see quite a bit when when people are, um, you know, looking for that is to is to just start something. Right. Because absolutely. It's, it, yeah. It, sometimes you can't see anybody out there. But even if you just say, hey, you know, game game group at, at our house once a month, if anyone's interested, you know, just even out to a local general homeschooling list. Yep. And often you'll find over time that it's the unschoolers that will more consistently show up, right? Yeah. yeah. And even, and you'll find like, as you, if you start those things and you just start chatting with people, you'll pretty quickly figure out if there's anybody mm-hmm. on the same path. And, um, that's, I know I really love, um, I love the internet because I love that people who don't have that in their local community can connect with other unschoolers. And then just for our family, I just feel so grateful that we have other people doing the same thing around us. That's huge for when I do kind of feel a little bit doubtful. Yeah, no, I mean, the in-person community, being able to see people face to face sometimes is, is so wonderful. Cause I mean, we, uh, when we first started, I didn't know anyone. Um, yeah in in our lives or even in our community really that was doing it we we tried we drove into the city and tried a couple of um Mm. drop-ins and stuff but didn't really find any connections there but like like we were saying you know james mentioned people flying from arizona we drove from ontario down to south carolina for our first conference (laughs) just so you know we could see some people face to face it's nice to put faces sometimes to the people that you've been connecting with online Line, right. I mean, the the ability to connect online is awesome. And I mean, that's how I found out about um, homeschooling and unschooling in the first place and, right. and could learn so much about it. Right. And I remember that first year or two, every morning, just, you know, getting up early before the kids were up to check the email groups, to check the forums and kind of get get my brain settled, get my little fix for the morning to, you know, just that deep breath of the, ah, there are people doing this and that's awesome. And, you know, the kids were up and we'd have a great day. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's huge. And actually that you kind of made me think of another little kind of strategy that I've been trying lately. And sometimes I'm better about it than others. But when I feel myself kind of going through a patch that, you know, where I'm feeling doubtful or worried about something in particular, um, I'll just... I, you know, I find little quotes and things that I read in books and on forums and blogs, and I'll just try to kind of pick one and focus on it. Like you said, you know, like my kind of fuel for the day. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think for me a lot lately, and you talk about this a lot and it really resonates with me is just 
thinking about kind of what's happening when I'm living in a place of fear. Um, and yeah. that for me is just, you know, James has helped me to see and also listening to you and reading other things that kind of every minute that I spend living in that place of fear about whatever hypothetical thing I'm worried about might happen in the future. It's just eating away at my time right now with my kids um, and with my family. And I'm really by no means good at this yet, but that's kind of what I'm working on remembering. Um, and I actually, I've been reading um, Teresa Graham Brett's book, Parenting for Social Change. Yeah. Um, and this one quote that I picked out had just really resonated with me. I read it the other night. She just says, when we control others and operate out of fear, we're less connected and less respectful and love is diminished. Um, and that That's for awesome. me, nice. yeah, that for me just really resonated because I, I keep coming back to the idea that if, if I'm connected to my kids, um, really and truly connected, then I, I really feel like most other things just really won't matter as much. Um, and so that's kind of just kind of trying to have those little mantras and quotes to inspire me um, has been somewhat helpful. I, I love when you were talking about uh, about focusing on that connection, because that's one thing that really helped for me a lot was when I when I noticed that I was spinning was to say, OK, just go focus on the kids for a while. And inevitably, I, I would just say, OK, you know, let that spin in the background and I would go and play, literally play with the kids mm -hmm. because building that connection back up again, um, you know, it was amazing when I actually spent more connected time with them, how easily the fear dropped away because all of a sudden you could see it all. It was all right there in front of you again, because when that connection got strong, you could see what they were doing. You, you could, could just, see their enthusiasm for life. And it's like, wow, this is, this is the point. Right. And, and then everything else would kind of drain away. That's cool. Yeah. It's, it's so true too. I, I know too, like my oldest, especially he's just so perceptive. And I think that he can really sense when I'm spinning, mm -hmm. um, yeah. because he can feel me kind of going into my own space and maybe pulling away a little bit because I'm living in, you know, some place of fear. Um, and then he is, or, he, or I try to convince him to, you know, spend his time doing something else, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or pull him away from what he's really into. And that just, I think that really chips away at kind of my credibility with him. And he then starts coming to me less with things he's excited about or he's not as likely to share what he's doing with me. And so I just, I try to remember that. And, you know, when I, when I can kind of cut that off and just like you said, um, and I probably, I think probably got this encouragement from listening to you, just go and be with them. Um, you know, it doesn't take long to pull him back and he gets excited again, but, um, mm -hmm. he's a good mirror, I guess. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's a great way to put it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's true too. Like when we really think about what our goals are for our relationships with our kids, because I think a lot of adults operate under the illusion that they can actually control the kids, right? <laughs> like that they yeah, can yeah. they can exert control. I, I mean, even in the sh in the short term, but in the long term in particular. And so, like when you think that, because sometimes I think like, hmm, I wonder if it would be more useful if the kids would be developing X skill instead of. Uh, you know, playing video games, uh, for instance. But mm -hmm. then I think, well, they're still going to learn it at the pace that they want to learn it, unless like we really go whole hog in the other direction. And we're definitely not going to do that. And so given that they're going to learn it at their own pace, well, what do I actually have control over? Really, what I have control over is are my actions, you know, how they and to a lesser extent, how they perceive me. And if they perceive me as trustworthy and as someone who is enjoyable to be around, you know, maybe they'll pick up on my values when it comes to how important like reading is or whatever else. And then maybe they won't, you know, but at some point in their life, I, I assume that they're going to want to learn the skills that are important to them. And that'll probably happen regardless of how much or little I pressure them. And so if that's going to happen anyway, if it winds up being important, then why would I choose to strain our relationship just to create something that will probably happen anyway? <laughs> you know, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't really seem worth it. And so choosing connection in those moments, it's much easier when I can kind of logic myself out of the, you know, the instinctive fear that comes with kids being a little different than I remember them when I was a kid, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's such a great point. And uh, I love that. Um, Cause that, it's not control, like the thinking of it maybe as influence. But if we just we choose our actions, you know, on one hand, you can say, OK, well, I'm going to act this way because then maybe my kids will pick up on it. But when you realize 
But those are the actions, when you think about it, those are the actions I would choose as a person anyway, because that's who I am. And then you can realize I'm just going to be me, you know, and we're all going to live together. And and then over over the years, you see the things, you know, the values that they pick up and everything. Um, But and then but then you realize, oh, I wasn't even trying to do that. I was trying to fully be myself and. And it's so beautiful when you see them doing the same thing, you know, and and we learn so much from them, too, when they do it, don't we? I know. Well, we so, see that all the time. Oh, go yeah. ahead. I, no, go I ahead. actually, OK, I you, it's kind of a funny little story just about that, Pam, um, just in terms of them kind of just living with us being authentically ourselves and picking up on things. Um, our oldest really wanted to um, make sure that he brushes his teeth every day because, um, you know, we've just talked about you know, it's James has Mm -hmm. had some cavities and whatever. So we just talked about how it's important to take care of our teeth. And he really wanted to remember. And he's asking like, how can I make sure I remember to brush my teeth? Cause I don't usually do it right when I wake up. Um, and then he kind of just caught on to the idea or, um, I think James has used it in other places that sometimes James sets timers or alarms on his phone to remind himself to do things. Um, so he started asking us to set a timer for one o'clock so he could remember to go brush his teeth um, <laughs> totally on his own. And then I showed him how to do it on his own iPad. So now he's been setting, you know, his timer and he'll hop up from whatever he's doing and go brush his teeth. Um, so it's kind of like a small little story, but something that he didn't need to be, um, pressured into or anything. He just kind of picked up on it by being around other people who kind of have responsibilities that they need to take care of. Yeah, I know. I love that story. That's perfect. <laughs> They, they, they'll figure out, I love that, that he's like, I'm trying to figure out a way to do this. Right. right? Yeah. It's... And, and he just saw the kind of tools that he sees you guys using and he's going to try that out. And, and that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of just fun to see those ideas develop. Yeah. Yeah. Just to see those things in action for yourself with your own kids. Right. Yeah. That just mm. helps, helps understand, um, I guess just seeing it in your own life, seeing those ideas in practice. There you go. Absolutely. Now, James, uh, you wrote a great article that was published in the December issue of Tipping Points, which is Thank the you. online magazine, yes, for the mm-hmm. uh, new Alliance of Self-Directed Education. Mm-hmm. Um, I really loved it. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's great. Uh, something that jumped out at me um, was sometimes when people are first learning about unschooling, I know it can seem, and it did to me, it can seem like almost a perfect life for children, right? But I really loved how you described the life of a real unschooling child. So I'm going to just share a little quote. Oh, thank you. (laughs) You wrote, our kids still make mistakes, but we help them work through their mistakes without shame. Our kids sometimes have regrets, but they don't resent us for causing them to miss out on the things that are important to them. Our kids sometimes get angry, but it usually comes from frustrating moments while doing things that are important to them, rather than getting angry because we are a barrier between them and their goals. Now, I loved all three of those points. That was awesome. But I really love that you brought up regrets because I think regrets kind of get the same bad rap that mistakes do. Mm. You know, um, I know as parents, we can get caught up in wanting our kids not to make mistakes, not to have any regrets, to have this perfect childhood. Um, And I think sometimes it's easier for parents to realize how um, worrying about mistakes can get in the way. Um, But I know regrets can be harder to frame, you know, because we if we see our kid regret something that they some choice that they made, we can feel bad and we can think, oh, you know, that was a a failure on my part. I maybe should have insisted harder that they do or not do whatever it is that they're regretting in that moment. Mm. Um, but really it's just more learning for the child, isn't it? I, I don't, I don't think that, uh, regrets are really a failure on our part now, unless we are specifically withholding information or something to influence that choice in the first place, you know, always that caveat, but you know, if we're working with them and and we have a conversation and they make a choice and, you know, later they regret it, that's really just learning and part of navigating life, isn't it? I think so. I mean, you know, we developed this actually at camp because, you know, one of the things that was unusual, about camp when we first put it into places, we actually got rid of 
uh, some of the rules around physical safety. And that's not a popular thing to go and share with your board, right? <laughs> like where you're like, yeah, yeah. I have some ways we can make camp less physically safe, you know, but the, uh, <laughs> but the point behind it all was that in a lot of ways, there were these really, in my mind, like low stakes rules that people have to avoid low stakes pains, you know, like a classic one that many, many camps share that I think most people don't even know is um, that most camps don't allow you to wear open toed shoes or go barefoot at camp, right? Uh, this started some stuff was published, I can't remember what, 70s or 80s or something that basically said, and in the no-duh category, that when kids wear open-toed shoes or go barefoot, they hurt their feet more, right? So this is uh, <laughs> obvious, I think, <laughs> but... The, the, what nobody ever discussed was whether or not they get injured, you know. And so we we sort of developed this lens to see um, what we allow the kids at camp to do in the hurt but not injured lens. So like if a kid's going to make basically a small mistake that leads to a temporary pain, we just let them make it. So sometimes it would look like staying up really late. So sometimes these uh, teenagers in particular might stay up till 4 a.m. at camp. And I would share this with other camp directors and they would say, well, Oh, what, then what happened though? You let them stay up till four. Weren't they exhausted the next day? And I'd say, yeah, <laughs> they were. <laughs> so, and they say, well, right. But they never get to the next point because to them, it's like so obviously wrong to stay up late and be tired the next day that they don't actually think about what the real consequences of that are. Because I'll tell you what, most of the people, and then I would always poll when I do public speaking in the camp world, I poll people, well, who here has stayed up too late before? And every single person raises their hand. And yeah. I say, well, and who here really regretted it afterwards? And so few people actually wind up regretting that quote unquote mistake that it actually doesn't seem to feel like much of a mistake at all. Now, sometimes, like I stayed up too late in college a handful of times and missed a class and some occasionally regretted it, you know. But I have now, in my adult life, I pretty much stay up as late as I want every night and still have to wake up at the same times. And, <laughs> and I've learned to, real, to manage it, right? Because in reality, staying up too late is not that big a deal. We all figure it out eventually, most of us. And, uh, and sometimes we regret it, but by and large, we figure it out. And I think kids are really the same way. And you can shield kids from these small mistakes, right? Like you can mm. shield them from, um, you know, having a, a, maybe you can shield them from having a friendship that might not work out very well. If you notice like a, a teenagers in particular, another friend is toxic, say, or uh, you can shield them from maybe a bad romantic relationship. Usually you can't, um, but you can try or at least express your, or try to discourage them from it. But for the most part, kids are, are going to pursue the paths that they want. Um, and sometimes they'll regret their decisions and sometimes they won't. But what I've found and, and for my own personal life growing up is that if someone's making a decision and they know someone else doesn't approve of it and they're going to make it anyway, then when they feel regret, they don't ever want to talk to the person who mm. try to dissuade yeah. them from it. Right. Like they feel ashamed. They feel like and they don't want to hear like the implied I told you so. You know, they don't want to hear any of that nonsense. What they want yeah. is comfort. And so it's this too, you know, it, it hits you coming and going. They, there's shame on the front side because you're expressing, you know, a lack of trust for their choice. And then when it actually doesn't work out, then they think you're going to be condescending toward them, basically. And um, none of those are beneficial to my mind. So, yeah, I'll still I wouldn't, you know, the old let my kid walk out in traffic because they wanted to um, <laughs> or play with boiling water when they're two. But I would let them stay up late or be in a friendship that I was worried about or whatever, because whatever, like they'll regret it and then we'll talk about it because we're best friends. You know, <laughs> that feels OK to me. And without that experience, how are they going to, you know, act, really figure it out for themselves, right? A hundred percent. Well, yeah. And I think that's another thing I always try to drive home with parents who are concerned because it's like, you know, like, well, what if my kid comes to camp and does something that they regret because they're given this extra freedom? And I said, well, what's your plan for when they're 18 or 22, right? Because when mm -hmm. I got to college, I'll tell you a yeah. lot of people, myself included, with this newfound freedom, um, never having taken it for a test drive before, used it really irresponsibly, right? <laughs> so. Oh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. I lost my my first year roommate was gone by December. And yeah. she was like a honor student coming in mm. because she just had no idea how how to use that freedom. Wow. Yeah. And I think our body, I mean, we see this biologically, like our bodies when they're young, we're designed to take our lumps and heal more quickly, you know, and we're, we're, we can learn languages more quickly when we're young. And I think we can also learn how to use freedom more easily when we're young. And, you know, by the time you've developed these habits of being told what to do and having your life planned for you, those are hard to break in adulthood. And many people, I think, not only do they have trouble breaking them, they just find new proxies for authorities, whether it's their boss or whomever, um, mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, a significant other or, you know, some other dangerous sort of uh, power over relationship. And they either wind up being really unhappy or unsatisfied or just, just doesn't work. So, yeah, I'm happy to let kids yeah. make those mistakes, you know. 
plus when when they're older too, not only do they have to try and um, figure out finally what works for them, they also have that voice in their head then, right? That they also that they have to work past versus yeah. just you know trying to figure out what works for them. Um, they have to figure out, well, this works for me and why does it not match that? And do I have to feel bad about that? And, you right. know, it's just a lot more voices in their head to work through than if they get to start fresh. Oh, yeah. I never want my kids to be sitting there making a decision in adulthood. And if it's something that they feel strongly about worry, like, well, is my dad going to be disappointed if I choose this? Like, man, that just is like my worst nightmare as a parent. So yeah. Yeah. I'm going to work hard to avoid it, you know. Yep. Yep. Um, you guys also mentioned to me that you're both self-employed and you spend about an equal amount of time with your kids. Um, I love hearing how families are putting that all together. So I would love to hear how you guys got to that point. Sure. James, I'll start and then, um, just jump in if I'm missing anything important. Yeah, you got um, it. <laughs> I think that it's been kind of a slow evolution for us. It's been like a lot of, um, like single changes that have kind of led up to where we are now. Um, I think that, you know, the first change for us was when James was playing poker and I was teaching and Oliver was a baby and me going back to work didn't, you know, it just wasn't working for him. Um, so that was the first change, right? It was Taylor needs to stop working and, um, James, James's work needs to be super reliable to support us. And that's when we kind of sold our home in New Jersey and moved to Vanderkamp. Um, so we moved pretty far away. It kind of felt a little bit risky, um, but it really felt like it's what our family needed. So we did that. Um, and I was, you know, James was working a lot of hours and I was very intense, you know, all, you know, hands on with kids because we had Ezra two mm -hmm. years after Oliver was born. So we had two really little ones. Um, and then after that, I, you know, when Ezra was an older baby, I started, um, I became certified to be a birth doula and that's the work that I started to pursue. Um and so I did what I could while we were at camp, you know, James was always really supportive. Um, and then when we kind of had outgrown our role there at camp and we moved to New Hampshire, um, we, we kind of just tried to structure our time and James can talk a little bit more about this better maybe, but we tried to structure our time in a way that, um, we both had time to pursue the work that we wanted to do. Um, and then, you know, the other time was spent largely with the kids, um, I don't know, James, maybe you can say a little bit about, you know, it looks a little different now since we now have another baby. Um, I've drastically scaled back on my work um, just because he's little and he needs me. Um, but I think that just kind of being willing to try different arrangements of things and also recognizing, you know, that um, I feel grateful that we're in a position that like I can scale back on my work right now and we're OK. Um, so that's been kind of helpful. Yeah, sure. So I, I think the other, the major component that came for us, and I think you summed it up pretty well, T, but is at some point we decided, I think basically when we decided we wanted to pursue unschooling six years ago, but when our first child couldn't even talk yet, <laughs> was <laughs> was that this was going to be a non-negotiable for us, you know? And I think that, you know, we've talked at length seeing and encountering people who will say, well, that sounds great, but it wouldn't work for our family. And I'll start by saying it wouldn't have worked for our family if we had prioritized other things, you know, in our house mm -hmm. that we owned, uh, we had a, a, an expensive mortgage for us at the time. And, uh, we weren't really equipped to be a single income family at the time. And so we just changed everything. You know, we, first we went to camp cause we could live on site and, you know, make not very much money, but have only one person working and have our, our housing taken care of. And, you know, we were lucky to be able to get that role, but it's something that we gave up a lot to do. I mean, we, took a six figure loss on the first house that we sold. <laughs> like we had a, mm -hmm. it was, it was a hard decision to make. Um, but and even when we were at camp, we wouldn't have left camp, I think, until we had the pieces in place to continue to make it work. And I think for us, that mindset shift from, it would be nice if we could do this to, we're just going to do this was what really made the difference because, you know, so while we were at camp, um, we both started to try to launch these side businesses, you know, me in two different spaces in terms of online businesses and um, some consulting work and Taylor with her doula work and also an online business, um, an online community called the New Mama Project, which she may 
maybe doesn't want to brag about on the podcast. <laughs> really cool. Um, <laughs> thanks. But no problem. But I think that, uh, you know, between the two of us, we just knew we had to make it work somehow. And so since we knew how to make it work somehow, we would do things like, you know, I'd work an eight hour day at camp and come home and we would play with the kids. And then we would both write at nighttime after Ollie was asleep and it was really tiring and it's not when we're at your creative best or whatever. And we just knew it had to happen. <laughs> so we did it, you know, I don't know. It's like, it's weird to think about now because now it's our life and it feels like easy mm -hmm. because it's comfortable, but it wasn't for a while. And we also just knew we had to do it. So we just kept doing it. <laughs> that sounds weird now. But. <laughs> no, I love the way you, uh, you spoke of it as, you know, this was your priority. This was kind of like, this is now what's a given in our life. And now let's figure out how to make that work. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. it wasn't going to be like something we brushed aside. Like, you know, some people it's like w the difference between brushing your teeth and exercising. Right. Like most people mm -hmm. don't say, well, I'm too busy to brush my teeth. I just can't get around to it. You know, like I just mm -hmm. so therefore I don't. They say, well, I brush my teeth twice a day or whatever. And that's just a non-negotiable part of their life. But they make excuses as to why they can't get to the gym. And we didn't want unschooling our unschooling journey to be the gym. We wanted it to be just something that happens because that's what mandatory in our life, you know. Well, yeah. And you threw up everything else was up for grabs, right? Like yeah. the house was, yeah. was an optional thing that, totally. you know, every, yeah, you, you made this, the grounding, the one thing, and then figure everything else was optional at that you could play with and, and see how that might fit. Right. Yeah. And sure. I think it's also, um, we stay really mindful that over time, kind of the way that our day-to-day -day life looks is going to shift and evolve all the time, you know, based mm -hmm. on, um, you know, our kids' ages and needs and based on what's earning us the money that we need to support ourselves. So I think, you know, even the day-to-day -day kind of breakdown of who's spending time working and who's spending time um, more focused on the kids, you know, it's changed so much in the past two years between, um, you know, moving to our new home and having a baby. And so I think just realizing and being okay with that kind of being okay with things looking different from year to year and always being willing to kind of throw it out there, you know, is this still working? Do we need to juggle some things around has been really helpful. Um, we've even had conversations like since we both do kind of run our own businesses and James is, you know, he earns most of our money. Um, you know, what if something went wrong with his business? We've even talked about, you know, we would, we've thrown out all sorts of things that we would do you know, keeping in mind that the kids would just stay home with us and we would just figure it out. <laughs> right. That would be, yeah. yeah, that's the primary thing that would not change. Yeah, that's, that's brilliant. I love that idea of, um, just, yeah, it's just being, being creative. Right. And, and even having the conversation, the little, what if conversations, especially, you know, now when there's no pressure because it hasn't actually happened, right. that's when you can be more creative, right? You can think of all these different, uh, ways that you might address those kinds of things. That's, that's really cool. I love that idea. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you guys so very much for taking the time to speak with me. I had so much fun. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pam. I loved it too. And I just thank you so much for all that you do. Um, I've pretty religiously listened to, I think, all your episodes, except for your most recent one so far. And um, <laughs> oh my goodness. It's, it's, it's just so, um, it's just one of the things that really helps me kind of continue in my process of de schooling. So thanks for all the time that you put into it. Yeah. Thank and, you very much. And I'll add to that when I, so I walk the dog in the morning and I have a silly habit where I listen to podcasts on my cell phone and they blast out loud for everyone to hear. And Taylor <laughs> worries that everyone's going to think <laughs> everyone's going to think I'm weird, but I just don't like headphones. Um, and so, but whenever I walk in and your, your podcast is playing Pam uh, Taylor's eyes light up, she says, you're listening to the latest uh, unschooling podcast. We can talk about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> we're, uh, we're, we really do adore the show and thank you so much for everything. Oh, thank you so much, guys. That's awesome. And I really loved all the stuff you guys had to share. It's so fascinating to get a little glimpse into your lives. So thanks very much for taking the time. I know it was a, a challenge. You've got all those kids to uh, <laughs> to manage. Like, that's not really the right word, no, but you okay. know we know what, what you mean. mean. <laughs> exactly. All these no, kids like count on us, yeah. Yes, that, that exciting time of yeah, life. Yeah, no, it was know, an honor. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. And before we go, where's the best place for people to connect with you guys online? James, do you have? 
Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, you can uh, go to campstoppingground.com and you can learn about uh, our our camp there. We're also at Camp Stopping Ground on Facebook or Twitter or really anywhere, Instagram as well. Um, you can say hi. We always love to talk and interact with more families, even in different places. If camp isn't a realistic thing for you now, we love to connect and spread the word about other people who are doing the same thing that we are, even if it's in a little bit of a different context. So uh, you can email me, James at campstoppingground.com and I can talk to you about that or you can just go to the Facebook page and say hi because uh, we're always interacting on there and sharing stories and you know connecting with other folks in the unschooling movement at large so that's uh, the best place for me and then I'll just add um, I I kind of do a lot of cat cataloging of our family's daily life on Instagram just to try to I mean for our own sake saving photos but also I love to connect with other unschooling families on there um, my account's private, but if unschooling families request me, I'll add them. Um, so that's T. Comitis, and Pam, I can send that to you. Oh, awesome. That's yeah. great. I will definitely be sure to friend you. And I had a lot of fun on the Camp Stomping Ground website. They have some great videos there. It's really fun. Yeah, Jack and Laura are really talented. They uh, The way they make it all work, because uh, this is Camp Stomping Ground is still mostly a very expensive hobby for all of us. Yeah, all, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, running a summer camp. So the way they make it work is they produce these amazing uh you know, graphically recorded videos in the style of that Ken Robinson video, actually. Um, and they do yeah. it for all sorts of people. You know, Peter Gray's a supporter of camp and, uh, you know, some other people like Lenore Skenazy. These folks have uh, helped us get our camp off the ground. And we have sweet videos of them talking and us drawing. So Laura drawing, I should say. So we'd <laughs> Laura, love for yeah. to check those out, too. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. So thanks so much, guys. I'll talk to you soon. OK, thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Bye. Thanks for listening. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. While you're there, be sure to check out the first book in my Living Joyfully with Unschooling series, Free to Learn, Five Ideas for a Joyful Unschooling Life. In it, I share the five paradigm-changing ideas that most help me better understand unschooling. Reviewers have said... A quick read, but packed with ideas that challenge the dominant paradigm of our failing approach to learning. This little gem makes an excellent argument for unschooling. And I was rather doubtful about this book, as I had never heard of the author, but after reading it, I wish that I had read it years ago. I hope you find it helpful too. Free to Learn has also been translated into French and Spanish. Until next time, have fun living and learning with your families.